its name is Research Does Not Stop Now. The title is even more opportune now than, than it was when we decided to start this series in the first uh, COVID uh, wave. Uh, we are committed to uh, keep on doing this kind of activities because we do think that in this period they are, they are extremely important. We are very pleased, and I'm personally very pleased to have uh, Professor Carolina Castaldi here uh, today with us. Carolina is a uh, full professor, Geography Innovation at Utrecht University. I don't know whether Carolina likes this definition, but I'm afraid that we should consider uh, an Italian brain on the run, <laughs> because uh, as far as I know, after a PhD at Pisa, Carolina left Italy for, for Netherlands, where she has been working for, for seven years already, uh, before at the Endoven, then at the University of Groningen, and now at Utrecht University. Um, Carolina is, is a, an innovation scholar across the board, so she's in, interested in, in each and every kind of, of innovation. So not only technological innovation, so innovation product or process innovation, but also other kind of not technological innovation, also say software, right? Including organizational or marketing or innovation in business models and services. So it's all kind of, of innovations that also at the regional level are, are, are important to detect and to uh, investigate. Um, recently she started investigating also in a, a particular kind of innovation which is sustainable innovation, which is also important at the regional level for, for the green transition, for, for, for green regions. So this is a topic which is very relevant uh, for, for our research uh, topics and research tracks at the GSSI. And, and, and in particular, she, she is, she's really an expert uh, in, in intellectual property rights uh, in, in addition to patents, so other than patents, which means trademarks in particular and, and design, which are two uh, kind of intellectual property rights uh, uh, on which uh, novel, interesting and original proxy and majors of innovation can be built up. And I think this is, yeah, no, I think this, this is front of view. This is the, the, the topic of her presentation today. Uh, which I think is, is very relevant also, you know, in the geographical or regional domains in which we are used to work with. It happened to me uh, to present my works using patents in a couple of conferences and I've detected a certain dissatisfaction for the use of patent statistics. And, and there's a certain demand for uh, other proxies and other measurements of innovation, also and above all the regional level, different from patents. Patents are extremely useful but they suffer from a number of limitations. And, and indeed looking for other measurements like uh, trademarks is, is to me and, and, to, and then to, to, to scholars to debate an extremely important uh, added value. Having, having said that before leaving the word to Carolina, I would remind to everybody uh, the rules of the game. Um, first of all, we have already started recording uh, this presentation, so if some of you or if some of attendees are not happy with that, it's, of course she's free to leave the room and, and eventually join the uh, presentation on the YouTube where we have uh, uh, Cara Burlina, who is a post scholar of us, following uh, the, 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 the broadcasting to see whether there are a question from there and in case you will report a question to me. On, on the chat. Uh, so Carolina is gonna um, talk for roughly an hour or more, more or less uh, during uh, her presentation, uh, uh, attendees and panelists are free uh, to post question. And I would suggest that to do it by inserting a brief uh, uh, text uh, either in the chat or in the Q and A bottom, uh, it would be myself uh, interrupting in case uh, Carolina to pose this question, which during her presentation uh, should be sort of short, uh, you know, clarification or spotlight kind of question. Instead, we're going to have time for a more extended discussion uh, at, at the end of the presentation where everybody will be entitled to talk uh, if, if, yeah, I think that we can allow basically everybody to pose questionnaire self or himself. 
I think that, that it's all from my side. So Carolina, the virtual floor is your and thanks for having a our invitation. Okay. Okay, thanks a lot, Sandra, for this uh, nice and elaborate introduction. Uh, thanks also to Andrea Scani for inviting me and uh, Alessandra Fajan, of course. Um, yeah, you, you have a great group there in Latvia. I hope to be able to, to visit you in person uh, sometime soon. Uh -huh. um, so what I would like to do uh, today is kind of take you uh, in this journey towards understanding whether trademarks uh, have any potential as metrics for innovation beyond the traditional ones. And as Sandra already mentioned, um, within innovation studies, but also within uh, regional studies, there is, um, yeah, the, uh, it's quite common to use patents as it, uh, innovation indicators, but they do have uh, some uh, known uh, uh, limitations. So I would like to share uh, my own journey, uh, as which basically started already more than 10 years ago. Um, and then uh, also share with you some uh, fresh evidence on uh, the latest project uh, exactly on this topic of trademarks and, uh, and innovation. Um, so my own personal reason to start using trademarks and trying to understand, you know, what could be the relation between trademarks and innovation was that I was interested in, in service innovation and innovation in service sectors. Um, so I, uh, and as an empirical economist, I, uh, I wanted to, uh, to have indicators that I could use in large samples of firms, uh, uh, regions and countries. Um, in a quantitative manner. Um, and uh, if you're interested in service innovation, there's only so much that you can do with patents. Uh, as uh, Sandro already mentioned, um, patents require a technological invention, uh, uh, while a lot of innovation happening in service sectors uh, might have to do with uh, um, um, new organizational forms, uh, new business models, uh, new service concepts, and all those non-technical, more intangible uh, forms of innovation are, um, yeah, are difficult to, to capture with patents. Um, but then when you are trying to understand the link between trademarks and innovation, um, you know, that's, that's not a, a direct or linear link. Right? So with patents, um, we have this uh, novelty requirement. Right? So this uh, uh, ensures that at least you're capturing some form of technological novelty when you're counting a patent. Um, when you file a trademark, a trademark, you don't need to prove novelty and there are other requirements. Uh, and so the, the link between trademarks innovation would sound a bit uh, far. Huh? Um, I like uh, this quote from Lee Davis, as she was uh, one of um, uh, the first researchers uh, to uh, write the first conceptual papers on, on trademarks. Um, she is based at the Copenhagen Business School. And she was saying, even though trademarks are not supposed to enhance innovation, they often do so in practice. And in addition, even though patents are supposed to enhance innovation, they may not do so in practice. And so even though we have patents exactly because they are meant to spur innovation, provide an incentive for inventors, uh, it's not always the case that patenting is about uh, innovation. Uh, and although trademarks uh, do not have this direct link with innovation, it is often the case that firms uh, that are trademarking have an incentive to invest in innovation, uh, for instance, to uh, upgrade the quality of the product uh, or to ensure the, uh, um, uh, that quality as, as, as promised by uh, their trademarks. Uh, so uh, all these this, this initial insights um, uh, kind of triggered myself and, uh, and then I found other people who wanted to uh, to, uh, to understand better the relation between trademarks and innovation. And this, uh, these have been my, my co-authors, uh, Mainder Flickema and Arpita de Man, uh, based at the Fuhr University in Amsterdam. So we took kind of a collective journey in understanding uh, this link. 
And when we started, uh, basically there was only one paper. And there was uh, this paper by uh, Sandro Mendonza, um, uh, uh, Pereira and Godinho, uh, so three Portuguese economists in research policy, 2004. Uh, and that was the first paper who um, that uh, proposed, uh, look, if you're interested in innovation in industrial dynamics, uh, trademark data uh, have a potential uh, to tell us uh, a number of things about uh, firms and their activity. Uh, so this this triggered us, and uh, and so we uh, you know we um, uh, we started uh, this this kind of long term research project. Um, so before I go into the details, I want to spend two slides on what are trademarks, because I guess you know uh, you may be familiar with uh, what patents are, uh, and maybe less familiar with with uh, the specific characteristics of uh, of trademarks. Okay, um, so trademarks as uh, signs uh, that distinguish products and services have a long history. And so uh, a couple of years ago, there was this uh, fantastic exhibition in Rome uh, called Made in Roma, uh, which was about how already in the Roman Empire, um, marks were used to identify uh, the, the source of, uh, of artifacts. And so uh, different artisans or producers would use them uh, to, uh, uh, to identify and differentiate uh, their products. Um, and then so there is a long history of uh, marking uh, your, um, uh, your products. Um, modern trademark systems are much more recent. Uh, and so the, the whole legal framework around trademark system is much more recent. But the, 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 the principle is, is basically the same. And uh, so the, uh, when, uh, when a trademark is filed, um, uh, it, it's about a sign, which can be a word, uh, can be a, 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 a figurative mark, a logo, uh, even a color uh, or a shape anything that allows distinguishing uh, products in specific markets. And there are basically two, uh, two roles. Uh, from, the, from the perspective of buyers, a trademark should allow to identify the source of origin of products and services. So if I'm at the supermarket and I'm uh, buying a banana, I have no other way of distinguishing uh, a banana from the other one uh, than that small logo put on, on, on that piece of fruit. From the point of view of suppliers, a trademark allows me to differentiate my offerings in the market from offerings from competitors, basically. Uh, so the economic function of trademarks is basically to uh, ensure that there are uh, less information uh, failures in markets. So there is uh, not a link to innovation, uh, the way I said it, but um, they're supposed to decrease transaction costs and provide incentives for um, producers to deliver a certain quality that consumers, buyers can recognize. Uh, this is the, in, in short, uh, the economic function. So how do you do it uh, when you uh, register a trademark? Uh, so you file a trademark, um, uh, at uh, the trademark office, similarly to what you can what you do with with patents, um, you file a trademark in a specific market. Uh, so uh, there are forty five uh, niche classes. Uh, some products and some are service uh, markets. Um, uh, so you you could actually use the same um, the same uh, name uh, uh, in in two different markets as long as there is no confusion. Uh, so that's the main uh, criteria. Um, then this this filing is uh, is published online by now uh, by the trademark office, and there are a number of checks that are that are happening. So the, the most important one uh, is this idea that in order to fulfill this informational role, um, a trademark should be distinctive. Uh, so this, the, um, there should be no confusion uh, between uh, the file trademark and other existing trademarks. Because if it creates consumer confusion, then it does not comply to the main economic function. Uh, there's also check whether it, it is morally offensive, uh, and uh, there is a check on whether uh, the filer, the applicant, uh, is using the trademark in the market 
or at least is intending to use it to use it in the market within a certain uh, amount of time. And so that depends a bit uh, upon the, the specific trademark office. But um, uh, this requirement is actually the what is uh, particularly interesting from the point of view of measuring innovation. So it's about something that uh, the, is in the market that consumers can choose from. And so it's commercialized. Um, uh, other firms or other organizations can also file oppositions uh, to the trademark filing uh, because they think that it, uh, um, it interferes with other trademarks uh, or because they think that the name used uh, is, is, not, uh, is not the right one uh, and so on. Uh, so there is in, in, in this uh, space between filing and registration, uh, you also see some legal uh, events happening, including uh, opposition. Uh, so if everything goes well, uh, then the trademark is registered um, and it, it lasts for 10 years typically. But this, uh, the validity of the trademark can be extended every 10 years indefinitely, uh, as long as renewal fees are paid. And this is an interesting feature and that's a feature that's, uh, for instance, exploited by pharmaceutical companies. Uh, so whenever um, patents uh, expire, um, then uh, they can rely on uh, established brands to keep on appropriating rents from the initial uh, new drug. Um, it can also happen that the filing results in abandonment or cancellation, uh, and then you see it in the trademark uh, register as a dead trademark. This can happen for several reasons. Uh, for instance, because maybe the trademark was filed for a specific marketing campaign that eventually didn't start, uh, but also because the company was planning to uh, use the trademark in the market, but didn't do it eventually. So they were not able to uh, provide this using market evidence. Okay. Um, so this was the, the short introduction on, on the trademark and how uh, you get a trademark. So now, uh, why, what would be reasons uh, for firms to file trademarks? Uh, so uh, basically, if you follow this, uh, you know, this basic economic rationale behind trademark systems, so the the you know the the, uh, the most common motives that you, you can think of are uh, the ones that have already been um, um, stressed quite a lot in. Uh, in the industrial organizational literature, uh, but also in the management literature. Um, so basically the idea that trademarks can be used as legal tools by companies to leverage differentiation strategies and allow uh, um, premium pricing uh, because of branding. And so there is some very interesting work by Andrea Fosfuri and Marco Giarratana uh, in, in, within management, but also some work in industrial organization. And there you see clearly that uh, if, if firms invest uh, in a trademark, which eventually can become a brand with complementary advertising investment, that can create barrier to entry and allow uh, companies to craft their own market position. And so within this perspective, uh, trademarks are very much related to, to branding. Um, but then, uh, yeah, throughout the years, uh, there have been other ways to look at trademarks. Uh, so um, the innovation perspective, and uh, that's perspective that I, uh, I uh, contributed to, and that started with this uh, seminal paper by, by Mendoza and co-authors. Um, in this perspective, we, uh, we are trying to understand how innovative firms are using trademarks. And what we find is that um, uh, trademarks are uh, also used by innovative firms to appropriate rents from innovation, and that typically happens in the commercialization phase. And so while patents refer to uh, invention, and so to the, the initial phase of the innovation process, uh, whenever technologies are then embedded in new products, uh, then trademarks come into play uh, in order to present basically the new product or the new service in the market. Um, what we also see is that uh, they may act as alternatives to patents in case of uh, innovation that is not so easily protected with patents. And so in case of services, soft innovation, but also um, 
uh, in case of SMEs uh, who might not have the resources and knowledge to engage in uh, very complex patent filings. Uh, so the, tra the trademark filing is in a way yeah, cheaper and uh, less uh, complex than a patent filing. Um, and even more recently, there has been a third uh, kind of stream of research on trademarks uh, and how they're used by firms, focusing on entrepreneurship and focusing so how on how startups uh, may actually leverage trademarks, in particular to attract uh, resources. And so by showing to, to potential investors, which can be venture capitalists, uh, but also uh, other types of investors, um, that they uh, have filed a trademark which is associated to an actual uh, product that they are planning to uh, introduce in the market, they can signal their quality. And so it allows, them, um, it allows the startups to, to show that they have downstream capabilities. Um, a, it might also be an interesting option when uh, startups opt for uh, a secrecy strategy. So whenever you, you file a patent, you're basically also disclosing knowledge. And so you are uh, giving uh, information about your key technology to uh, not only to investors, but also to potential competitors. While when you file a trademark, uh, uh, you don't have to disclose anything about the underlying technology. But of course, you, know, you are saying to the market and to investors, uh, this is you know, how you, we want to enter into the market. And in this perspective, uh, Jörn Block uh, has been one of the um, uh, key researchers. Um, so and it's, these three perspectives um, basically have been key in a, in a special issue in industry innovation that we, we just published uh, together with uh, Jörn Block and uh, Mender Flickema, um, which includes uh, works uh, that have taken uh, one of these perspectives or a combination of, of, the, uh, of the three. Um, and um, in the editorial to this special issue, we have um, kind of proposed a conceptual framework uh, to try and understand what are the key motives uh, for, uh, for firms to, to file trademarks. So we propose that the two di dimensions that matter are on the one hand, uh, so on, on, uh, on, on the row side, uh, the firm life cycle, uh, so uh, it matters whether it's about a young firm or a mature firm, uh, but it also matters at which stage of the innovation life cycle um, uh, a firm or a project is at, uh, whether it's an idea, the idea phase, uh, an intermediate R&D phase where maybe a prototype is already uh, taking shape, or the commercialization phase. Um, and so uh, briefly, when you look at mature for firms, uh, what the evidence is telling us um, is that they uh, would typically uh, file trademarks uh, uh, in the commercialization phase and uh, later on, often um, with motives that are quite similar to the strategic motives uh, that uh, an industrial organization perspectives would tell us. Uh, sometimes they also uh, file trademarks so that they can um, uh, trade them as assets in markets for brands um, and, um, or for reasons uh, to, to prolong protection after patent or copyright uh, expiration. While if we, uh, if we look at the literature on young firms as startups, we see that um, they may have incentives to uh, to file uh, trademarks even a bit earlier, already when they, when they have an initial uh, sense of uh, the type of product or services that they're going to introduce in the market, um, and, uh, and that they, uh, they use it as a signal uh, to attract resources. And so there is evidence that uh, startups with um, uh, with a trademark filing uh, receive more venture capital funding uh, uh, and uh, um, and also they show uh, higher growth. Uh, so that uh, in a way they they show that they are uh, really uh, ambitious uh, entrepreneurs. Um, okay, so this is. Uh, uh, the you know the whole picture about you know how firms use trademarks 
So what you see in terms of using trademarks as metrics, you see that uh, more and more uh, innovation scoreboards of this of different types are including uh, uh, trademarks uh, next to, to patents and all other all kinds of other indications. Here I put a kind of a collage of different um, uh, indicators. So on uh, on the uh, left side uh, top. Um, uh, even the science and engineering indicators, a publication from uh, the National Science Foundation uh, in the US, uh, has added a, session, a section on uh, beyond patents. Uh, so they include trademarks and plant varieties, uh, uh, interestingly. Um, uh, down, I have um, uh, an, the example of the European Innovation Scoreboard, where um, trademark applications are counted next to patent and design application. And on the right hand, um, uh, I have the example of the global competitiveness report, where uh, in the pillar about innovation capability, um, they include trademark application to account for commercial, commercialization uh, ability, um, basically in a, in a country. Uh, the, the level is always national in this case. And so I like this the way they do it uh, because clearly the you know the patent application R and D expenditure and even scientific publication tell us something about the R and D uh, part of the innovation process, but they cannot tell us much about the the downstream phase and uh, the commercialization phase, and that's where trademarks can play a role. Um, so once we, you know, we start including more of these trademark counts in innovation scoreboards, and this is at the national level, but uh, also some regional scoreboards are including trademarks as well. Uh, then we also start wondering what is it exactly that we are capturing? Eh? So how valid is it to consider uh, trademark counts as measures of innovation? Eh? And so we we took this question. Uh, to our heart, uh, with uh, with the uh, with the team uh, uh, together with Flickema and uh, the man, um, and uh, so we um, engage in trying to um, to check the validity of trademarks as innovation indicators. And our strategy has been uh, of taking two different steps. And so, in the first step, we try to collect uh, sample samples of new trademark filings. And then uh, uh, measure uh, the percentage of these trademarks that would refer to innovation. Right? So, out of a sample of trademarks, how many are referring to innovation? And right? so, that was the approach that we took in uh, in the 2014 paper in industry innovation and 2019 paper in research policy. Um, and those were the first studies at the trademark level, at the project level, eh? while before uh, most of the evidence was at the firm level. Eh? So simple correlations between different innovation managers at the firm level. So we took a sample of trademarks and we found already uh, a couple of factors that were positively related to a higher chance of referring to innovation. And so, for instance, we found that um, so-called brand creations, so new trademarks filed uh, that didn't have uh, a relation in terms of word root or uh, figurative similarity with existing uh, trademarks of the same firm had a higher chance of referring to innovation. We found that filings by startups had a higher chance. Uh, filings at international offices, in our case, the European level, uh, instead of filings at the domestic level, had a higher chance. And also, uh, if trademarks were combined with patents, that also increased substantially the chance that the trademark referred to innovation. Okay, so this is basically the this, this summary of our step one. Uh, we're now busy with, with step two, which is the other way around. And so we want to start from a sample of innovations and then figure out what's the share of those innovations that get trademarked. So if we would count trademarks, uh, how many of those innovations would we be able to capture? Um, and so in this work, uh, what, uh, what we did in the, in the last one or two years, uh, we were collecting samples of innovations 
and we decided to use two sources of data, uh, trade shows uh, and innovation awards. I will um, explain in a moment um, exactly uh, how and what. So the idea, uh, and this is what I'm going to present, this is the uh, work in progress. Uh, this is work by a new PhD student uh, of, of us, Pablo Morales. So I should give credits to, to, to him uh, for uh, the pictures and, uh, and, and the empirical analysis and uh, uh, this, this paper. Um, so this is basically uh, kind of the scope of our study. Uh, so we are starting uh, with a sample of innovations we know some of them will be patented, some of them will be trademarked, and some of them might both be patented and trademarked. Um, we, are, we also know uh, that there, there will be uh, patents, patents that are eventually not commercialized and trademarks that are not innovative, but that's outside the scope of our study. And so we really focus on innovations and the extent to which they're either patented or trademarked or both. Huh? Um, so, uh, to collect these samples of innovations, um, we kind of go back to some of the classic approaches within innovation studies. So, innovation awards, there's, there's a few studies, uh, for instance, also work by Alessandro Nuvolari, um, that have used um, uh, listings of innovation awards to, to have samples of innovation and then look at uh, IPR strategies of these innovators. We use two uh, Dutch innovation awards. The first one is uh, the Blue Tulip, uh, used, used to be called Accenture Innovation Awards. So it's organized by, by Accenture. Uh, and the other one is organized by the Chamber of Commerce. They are both targeting innovation, uh, which we call sustainable, in the sense they have to um, have a link with um, some kind of uh, grand societal challenge, uh, which can be environmental, social. Uh, 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 there's you know, a whole list of themes uh, to which the, um, uh, the candidates uh, to the awards can, uh, can link to. Um, and these awards, uh, uh, what we see, it, it, they mostly cover uh, innovations from startups and SMEs. And, but this is, you know, is, is interesting and we like uh, this property. Um, in order to also have um, kind of a broad overview of innovations coming from, from larger firms, from more established sectors, we uh, collected innovations uh, from trade shows. And so trade show is basically a rather specialized uh, event where um, companies active in an industry go and present their latest uh, uh, products or services uh, uh, to demonstrate, you know, what they are doing uh, in terms of, of innovation. Um, so we chose for a very broad um, coverage of all kinds of different industries. Uh, so going from horticulture, coffee, food, uh, and uh, service industry suppliers, but also more high tech sectors like uh, blockchain, artificial intelligence. Um, and so overall, uh, our our uh, our idea was to to try and have an innovation a sample of innovation which would give us a very broad um, uh, coverage of all kinds of innovation huh? because our feeling is that that with trademarks we are actually you know, be able to, uh, we are able to say uh, well to to capture more of these types of innovation than uh, than with uh, patents. Okay. Um, Yes, so what we did, uh, so we con we contacted uh, uh, trade show participants and award candidates and uh, um, had them fill out a survey uh, about one selected innovation. So they had to choose one new product or new service. Uh, and eventually we, we have a sample of almost 800 innovations. Uh, we even have some more data, uh, but you know, what I'm presenting today is based on this on this sample. Uh, in the survey, we asked a bunch of questions about uh, the firm uh, demographics, the sectors in which you're, they're in, the type of innovation, uh, also the type of innovation process. Uh, was was it more collaborative, open, or or, uh, or more uh, traditionally closed? Um, and what we do in in this paper, we, ba we basically do. 
uh, just a descriptive analysis uh, because uh, we think that you know, the main effort is in collecting these uh, samples of innovation and in trying to uh, to figure out two things. Uh, first, what is the propensity to patent and trademark this innovation? If you want, this is kind of a seminal question so already from, uh, uh, from uh, the, um, the service like the Cohen et al. type of service. Uh, and then use this information to, uh, to measure the actual improvement in innovation measurement that you would get uh, by uh, adding trademarks to patents. And so uh, patents is our standard indicator in innovation studies. What, how much more can we, uh, can, we, uh, 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 can we measure in terms of innovation if we add trademarks? So eventually, um, we are able to populate uh, this, this picture that I showed you before, which is the scope of our study. And so this is a, a bit busy, of course, but I'll, I'm going to uh, explain the details later. But basically, uh, um, of, uh, of the blue circle, which is all our, uh, all our innovations, we are able to find that, um, so about 23% on average are exclusively patented, then a bit less than 20% are both trademarked and patented, and then there is uh, a similar share, uh, which is exclusively trademarked, okay? And we can um, uh, do this type of calculations, of course, on average, we can do it for uh, the specific subsamples that we have. Uh, we can do it uh, conditional of any uh, um, of the variables that we measured. So let me uh, focus on uh, the differences between uh, you know, the trade shows, innovation awards, as compared to the entire sample, and also you know, what is the main message in terms of improved measurement. Um, okay, so if we, if we look at the uh, entire sample, so if we would use patents only, we would be able to capture 42.3% of all innovations. Huh? Um, if we uh, add trademarks, then we get to a total measurement of 61.9%. So if we calculate the improved measurement uh, as basically uh, uh, indeed how much uh, more innovations are we able to capture by adding trademarks to patents, we find that on average for the entire sample, we improve the innovation manager me measurement by 46%, okay? So this is quite substantial. Uh, um, uh, we we see uh, some differences between trade shows and innovation awards. Uh, so if if you look at the pictures uh, below, we find uh, for trade shows that actually uh, the, the patents and trademarks capturing uh, is quite similar, and there is uh, uh, an overlap of about twenty three percent. For the innovation awards, we find the patents uh, are more used uh, than trademarks but the overlap is less, okay? Um, so um, with this uh, type of uh, measures, uh, we are able to get an understanding of which are the contexts in which um, adding trademarks delivers the greatest value added, basically. So we can do this um, for all the factors we measured. So, so we can look at, uh, the increase in, me in measurement uh, for uh, small firms, uh, for firms uh, in, uh, in specific sectors, for firms uh, doing open innovation. In this picture, um, um, you see uh, the different factors that we measured. Um, then uh, the bars refer to uh, whether the innovations were only exclusively patented, both or, or exclusively trademarked. Uh, and um, the, the picture is ranked uh, from the lowest to the highest measurement with patents only. And so if you, uh, if you are at the bottom of, the, of the, this picture, you find, for instance, science-based. And so for science-based uh, innovation from science-based sectors, we know that patents are actually a pretty good indicator. And indeed, uh, we find that... Um, 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 the uh, improvement in measurement, uh, which is indicated on the right hand, is only 9%. Uh, 
Um, so the improvement in measurement differs quite a bit. And so on average, it's 46%. But we have cases in which we find uh, uh, even 80%. Uh, and there are cases in which we find um, 9%, 27%, and so on. So this is uh, almost impossible to read. So let me summarize the main results. OK. Um, so what we uh, we find that the improvement in measurement uh, of adding trademarks to patents only is most significant in lower tech manufacturing and service industries, which we expected. We didn't expect it um, to be not very significant for, for KIPS, uh, for knowledge intensive business services. Uh, we find in our sample that this uh, this specialized knowledge intensive uh, business services are actually uh, using patents a lot, uh, which means that the, the value added of using trademarks uh, is less uh, evident. Uh, we find also significant improvement in measurement when it comes to young firms and to small firms, which is also something that uh, is in line with uh, our guesses. Um, but we, we do find also uh, that uh, incremental innovation uh, also has a, a more uh, significant addition um, um, in measurement um, from adding trademarks. Um, so what um, if we look at the difference between product and service innovation, which was actually the, the initial reason for me to look into trademarks, we still uh, uh, we, we still have that uh, looking at service innovation, even combining patents and trademarks, we are only able to have a total measurement of 50%. So for all the service innovations in our sample, if we would count them with patents and, and trademarks, we would only capture a half. While for product innovation, it's 70%. Uh? Um, to me, uh, that means that um, that it's still quite difficult to, to measure service innovation, probably also because it's difficult to define it and there is a lot of variance uh, in uh, the different forms of service innovation. And so this might be something to, to discuss as well. Um, uh, let's see, I think, you know, uh, overall, uh, we have, um, what we find is that uh, if we would uh, complement uh, patents more often with trademarks, we would be able to capture more innovation that is coming from uh, sectors that are different from high-tech manufacturing, uh, from firms that are not only the large uh, and established firms, and, and maybe uh, it's, it's a more incremental form of innovation, uh, which does not mean that it's not uh, relevant uh, innovation. Okay, um, of course, um, this is uh, you know, part of, uh, of a large research project. Uh, there, is, there are some further steps needed, uh, uh, which we might do ourselves, but we hope other people also will do. Uh, so this idea of digging deeper into service innovations and service innovators uh, to try and see whether we can stretch uh, innovation measurement there, uh, maybe adding uh, information on uh, design rights uh, or, uh, or in other ways. Um, this work was based on, uh, on the Netherlands. Uh, of course, we would love to see more validation uh, for more geographies, other countries. Um, uh, in general, um, uh, I feel that um, some of the the greatest potential for for um, using trademarks as innovation indicators more and more is also to try and leverage uh, information from uh, trademark uh, records, from public records. So uh, characteristics of trademarks that would allow uh, us distinguish those trademarks that refer to innovation um, uh, from uh, trademarks that are not referring to innovation. Uh, so trying to bring together what we know uh, from the two sides of, of the story. And also, uh, it would be great if, we, if it would be, poss would be possible to link more and more firm-level databases with patent and trademark databases. 
because uh, uh, then you are able to to take into account uh, more uh, firm characteristics. Uh, so, for instance, you might you might find that uh, you want to uh, mostly count trademarks from uh, from uh, uh, smaller firms or from firms uh, with certain characteristics, uh, and then you would be able to to do that. Uh, I should say that uh, by now, uh, uh, commercial databases like Orbis are including both patent and trademark filings, but it is, it is of course, only uh, the larger firms uh, and uh, linking the whole uh, population of firms uh, uh, is still quite, uh, you know, quite, quite some work. And so only if you have connections with the, um, the national uh, chambers of commerce, uh, um, that is something uh, feasible. Huh? So in the US, uh, uh, there are people at the US Census Bureau that uh, have been able to link um, uh, firm patent and trademark databases. Uh, we are able to do it for a short period of, of time, uh, for five years uh, for the Netherlands. Uh, uh, and hopefully we can extend uh, um, that type of exercise. Um, so uh, I will conclude with uh, with a picture with uh, you know all the information and kind of a summary of uh, what uh, this latest study is about, and I look forward to your questions uh, related to this or more general about trademarks. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Carolina. First of all, for the overarching introduction that you have offered to us about the topic of trademarks, indeed, some of us may be not entirely familiar with, with, with the concept and with the, say, motivations for trademarking. So that was really helpful. And also for the very interesting uh, research work you have been doing in the past, but you're currently doing uh, that you have presented. Uh, now it's time for questions. Um, as usual, uh, if there's someone among the attendees that want to raise a question, uh, uh, is free to do it. If, it, if she is or is a panelist, I think she is entitled. Is entitled to directly because she is in, is entitled to talk without passing through the chat. If it if she is or is an, an attendee, she. Or she could go through the, the chat and I will be myself posing the question to, to Carolina. So any question uh, from the floor? Uh, otherwise, I have a couple of questions to... Sandro, I do have a question, but I couldn't find a way to raise my hand. Normally, right. it's there, it's, but... It's in the participants... Uh, yeah, yeah, it is, I see that, but I can't see... It. Normally, it's there, I know, but anyway, <laughs> I right. do have a question. Uh, you can go ahead, Alessandra. <laughs> Okay, Karina, very interesting. Uh, I find fascinating that uh, uh, it is more difficult to measure service innovation, even when you use trademark. But having said that, I'm kind of happy about that because me and Adriana find some kind of similar problems uh, when we are looking at trademarks and patents and international migration in our paper. So it, it makes sense in a sense. Um, okay, so I know that this is out of the scope of your paper, but I have to ask you anyway, because I'm sure maybe you have done some work on that uh, anyway, even though it, it wasn't in this particular paper. Do you have an idea of the special distribution of trademarks? And I'm asking you, of course, because I have in mind this paper that I'm working with Adriana. Uh, if you look at more peripheral areas, do you expect or, or did you find, I don't know, trademarks to have more of a role than patents or not? Okay, uh, yeah, thank you, Alessandra. Um, yeah, I was expecting a question on the geo geographical side of the story uh, and uh, perfect. I mean, this is something I'm also working on uh, and I'm uh, trying to do more and more. Um, okay, so what you see, uh, and I've, I've seen some evidence uh, for different countries, is that there is a strong spatial correlation between patents and trademarks. Uh, so on average, uh, regions that have high levels of patenting, also high levels of trademarking uh, for different reasons. Uh, one reason is that uh, the large firms uh, uh, tend to be intensive users of both patents and trademarks. Uh, so uh, whenever they 
um, uh, they locate uh, uh, in a certain uh, successful region. Uh, yeah, they you see this uh, this strong uh, correlation. Um, also, uh, service sectors uh, uh, like uh, keep set and to concentrate where the the clients are. Um, the other thing is that, uh, so with patents, uh, you can distinguish be between uh, the location of uh, the, the, the owner, uh, uh, the applicant, and the location of the inventor. While with trademarks, you cannot do that. Uh, so it means that um, even you know, uh, a multinational company or a company with different locations, uh, trademarks will be concentrated at the headquarter level. Uh, so this gives a bit of a biased picture because it could still be the case uh, that a service has uh, been invent invented and, and tried out uh, uh, at a, uh, not at the central location, uh, but then um, there is a concentration of uh, uh, a trademark filing at, at that level. Uh, so this is an issue. Uh, so if you consider um, the role of large firms, uh, uh, it's a bit difficult uh, to to really trust the the geography of trademarks there. On the other hand, uh, what we find is that by using trademarks, you are kind of uh, uh, able to capture all these other innovation activities coming from firms that are not these large firms. Uh, and so, in that sense, I'm quite optimistic that that you can find uh, uh, activities also in regions where you don't have uh, large firms. Uh, and so I'm, uh, um, um, I, I don't have all the results uh, uh, yet, uh, but um, my hope is indeed that you can use uh, trademarks also to capture innovation in uh, well, maybe call it peripheral regions or at least regions where you don't have a strong high-tech uh, base, right? Um, yeah, no, I, I'm telling you why, because we do have maps of the patents and trademarks and design in Italy. And what we are observing, well, you know Italy very well, although you're working in, in the <laughs> Netherlands. Of course, they are correlated, especially correlated, because in the north, there are more of both. But while you look at patents and at a certain point going down towards the south, they, they kind of disappear. Uh, with trademarks, they go a little bit more down south. It's like the special yeah. dispersion is a little bit uh, more. And so we, this was a little bit of our starting point. So I was just wondering yeah. if you... No, yeah, so it, it's great because uh, I, I haven't seen the data for Italy. Uh, of course, in the Netherlands, there is less violence. Uh, so you see less uh, these patterns. But I, I started doing uh, work also in the US. Uh, so I hope to be, you know, to be able to say something about that. But that, that would be exactly my expectation because trademarks cover many more sectors. Uh, and so there is a higher chance that you find still interesting activities. And to me, I mean, even if it's might not be related to innovation the way we think about it as you know new to the world type of innovation it would still be about uh, uh, a new product introduction or commercialization activities that tell us an interesting story uh, about things that are happening um so yeah uh, i'm, that's, I'm that's, glad you are you are an expert so it, if it makes sense to you i'm happy <laughs> thank you very much <laughs> yeah and, and, and the, i think there are also other ways in which uh, trademarks relate to geography, um, even though you know, even if one does not believe the story of innovation, uh, uh, one link is, of course, that uh, you have so-called geographical indications, and so those are kind of trademarks, collective trademarks that specific places that are focusing on uh, specialty um, can can leverage as an as an asset. Um, there's also quite some fascinating work in, in even in marketing, uh, uh, but also uh, it also touches upon regional studies on how companies can use uh, links to geography in their trademarks uh, uh, or links to history. Uh, there is a very nice um, uh, paper in Journal of Marketing by uh, some Spanish researchers uh, on uh, selling history. Uh, so it's it's about the extent to which firms might leverage historical, local, cultural uh, heritage uh, in, in their marketing, uh, which you can look at it from a 
from a critical perspective, uh, maybe you know, as cultural appropriation, if if it's about uh, Nespresso uh, leveraging all kinds of Italian uh, assets in, in their marketing, but you can also see it as the way for yeah, local uh, uh, companies that try to you know to really uh, leverage their own local uh, uh, specialties uh, in in the in the marketing activity. So I think that's uh, and. Um, I haven't seen uh, much work on this, but there is, I think, lo lots of potential to also study collective trademarks, uh, which, uh, uh, I mean, of which ge geographical indications are only a small part. But collective trademarks can be about, uh, like, local associations, uh, all kinds of initiatives uh, that are coming from uh, not just one company, but from uh, groups of people. Uh, people or groups of organizations that decide to to have a collective uh, mark and i think that you know that tells also a lot about the uh, about geography uh, in that sense so just to to mention thank you very, thank you very yeah. much thank you all right thank you uh, i'm not sure whether ugo uh, want to ask a question uh, he wrote something in the chat ugo are you there are you willing to pose a question uh, yes Ugo, yes. Ugo, start to say professor at the GSSI, please Ugo, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Carolina, for your uh, very interesting talk. I would like uh, to, to ask you, uh, is there a difference when it comes to discussing uh, the benefits of uh, trademarks and patents uh, uh, about sectors? Like now with the, uh, the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, uh, there is a lot of debate uh, about the uh, vaccination and about uh, uh, registering and, and about the, the public interest in having uh, an, an open uh, an openly accessible uh, uh, um, vaccination program uh, so there are on the one hand those that uh, think that uh, the, the the patents and trademark system uh, ensures more uh, uh, competitions amongst firms so uh, it enhances the propensity to, towards innovation and uh, for instance uh, by uh, tech uh, startups on one hand on the other hand there are those uh, who, who think that especially in, the, in these sectors like life sciences biotechnology in which the public interest is, is so strong rather than uh, making a profit you know uh, that uh, uh, the, the patents and trademarks uh, system uh, undermines uh, uh, interfirm cooperation and interstate uh, uh, cooperation. So do you think that there is a conflict between uh, in these uh, trademarks and the patent system between uh, cooperation and, and, uh, uh, and competition in, uh, in a way? Or there is a, a way to reconcile them? And uh, there is a difference uh, between sectors, say, between uh, uh, making clothes or uh, uh, computers uh, um, and uh, the life sciences uh, sector, for instance, that is a really innovative sector, the life sciences, but uh, in which the uh, uh, state funds, uh, public funds are really relevant, they really make the difference, you know, uh, compared to other more commercial uh, sectors. Thank you. Okay. Sorry yes. for too many things. Uh, yeah, very interesting question. Also broad, I, th I see different things. Uh, uh, in your question, so one thing is um, uh, related to, to COVID, eh? to what extent uh, trademark strategies might stand in the way of uh, finding solutions, uh, also medical solutions uh, uh, to, um, uh, to the corona crisis. Um, yeah, indeed, um, we see most of the discussion on, on, on patents and the patents on the vaccine. Uh, but there is also some discussion related to uh, trademark and design rights protection. Uh, for instance, uh, um, um, the fact that uh, when uh, companies started to produce uh, uh, things like R&D printed uh, versions of, uh, of the uh, medical equipment or they... Uh, um, um, uh, change the medical change existing tools to make new ones that would fit the needs of the crisis um, in principle uh, there um, uh, companies could sue uh, other companies for infringing uh, trademark 
uh, as well. Uh, so um, this is part of the general idea that uh, uh, some companies, for instance, frustrate all uh, initiatives towards repairing or um, changing characteristics of products. Um, and so um, uh, in principle, companies could have said, okay, no, you cannot uh, reproduce this product or add components that are not trademark protected, uh, that are not original uh, uh, components from uh, us as the original equipment manufacturer um, because you're uh, uh, infringing trademarks. Uh, so in the case of the COVID, uh, mostly you saw that companies avoided to start these legal suits. But if you look um, uh, at, at other phenomena, for instance, like um, uh, this example of the right to repair kind of initiatives, you see that uh, the companies, uh, you know, the big ones, Apple, but uh, also other companies, um, they use trademark protection as, uh, as an argument uh, towards uh, blocking uh, repair initiatives. Uh, uh, so, and this goes against uh, uh, missions towards circular economy and, and more sustainability. And so they claim uh, in order to guarantee the quality of our products, uh, uh, if you do repair, you have to do it with our own uh, trademark protected uh, um, components. Um, and so they, they, yeah, they are basically blocking all kinds of, of, of initiatives. Uh, but other companies uh, are not. Uh, so uh, there is quite a, quite a strong uh, variety. But in general, indeed, the question is to what extent are IPR regimes, which uh, might be based on a logic of appropriation, uh, in line with initiatives where the underlying logic is one of sharing? Uh? And I actually I find this uh, quite interesting as a topic. Uh, I'm uh, also planning to do uh, research on this, specifically in the case of the circular economy. Um, and uh, yeah, you see a lot of variance in how companies use it because, so even if you uh, file a trademark of a patent, uh, that doesn't mean that you will use it in the same way uh, as other companies. And uh, you can still decide, for instance, to enforce it uh, very strongly or um, to just leave it uh, or to license it for free. Uh, and uh, so there, there is a whole range of um, ways in which company can, can use IPRs. Uh, so my idea is that the simple ownership of a, of a trademark of a patent does not tell us enough on how uh, companies eventually use it. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so I don't know if this answers all your questions, but then, oh yeah, the, the question whether this, this, this differs across sectors. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a big question, but indeed, you know, the extent to which funding is coming from public sources instead of uh, uh, private ones is, you know, uh, is important for the societal discussion on the extent to, to which you want to allow strategic practices or, or not. Right? So this is important. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Then I have another okay. couple of questions. Uh, I uh, see there's Adriana Pinate, uh, to whom uh, Alessandro was referring before, is post scholar, postdoc scholar at us. So, Adriana, are you still there? Yes, okay. I'm here. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, Carolina. Thank you so much. I really like it. I read everything, <laughs> all of the trade my world. <laughs> and uh, I think that, uh, well, is the scoreboard European Commission already used it, trademark design and patent? together with other type of uh, uh, measure to even use that regional indicator of, of innovation. So my question in fact is about something. It's like, okay, trademark is a non-technological innovation or not innovation, but not, let's say, no technological a position of a product generally into a market, especially when you want to be international. So my question is, I think that the, perhaps uh, I don't know if it is possible to do this. There may be a correlation with the field of education because the difference between patent and trademark is that generally who patent, you have to come from a field that is more science, not by force, but 
treatment is very correlated to technology. And when there are uh, papers about uh, the field of the, the people who, who field for patents, science in treatment or not. I have a lot of friends who work in the world of uh, like Giorgio Armani, all that stuff. And they treatment a lot, a lot, but they're all marketing. So they are not on the field of uh, science, pure science. So I think that uh, treatment is, is even in a way of innovation that uh, from people who come from a field that uh, you say they're more positioned perhaps in services, but not by force come from uh, those fields that are more collegated to, techno to do, do technological innovation because it's, you require some uh, own, I think, characteristic to, to patenting that, that are completely different from trademark. So I don't know if you think it, it might can be some type of, uh, I don't know, correlation about that. Like if there's something there or you think that there is nothing to be there about it. I don't know, it's just... Uh... <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, what, what you would see um, in, in large firms, uh, you would see that it's different people that are behind uh, patent filing, eh? so those would be the those um, uh, workers uh, involved in R&D activities, which indeed might have a more technical background while uh, um, uh, the people behind uh, the, uh, the development and the filing of a trademark uh, will be the the, yeah, the the marketing, the designers also. Uh, so more, uh, if you want, creative professionals. Uh, uh, so if you if you are um, um, if you are looking at, at the level of small firms uh, in, uh, that indeed might be specialized in uh, specific sectors which are more about uh, softer, uh, non-technological uh, activities, uh, then you would see a stronger correlation with trademarks. Uh, at the large firm level, um, you might find it if you are if you have data on uh, occupational uh, tasks. Huh? So uh, because we know not all the uh, uh, you know not all the creatives work in the creative industries, for instance. Huh? They they work also in large firms and they're responsible uh, for making uh, a product uh, uh, more persuasive and more attractive for consumers uh, to, to, to buy. Eh? And then that is uh, something that eventually you know, is related to um, uh, also to, to the trademark filing. So there is this, uh, yeah, the, um, uh, the, the book by uh, Paul Stoneman uh, on soft innovation, to me is one of the, the best references to understand this, you know, this uh, linkage also between the different type of knowledge that go into innovation. Eh? So innovation uh, is not only about the technological knowledge. Uh, and this is uh, something that uh, often is forgotten uh, in the literature. So if you don't have that book, you should buy it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, I have to buy it. Thank you. <laughs> Oh yeah, Sandra, you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> so thank you, thank you, sorry for that. No, uh, I don't know whether I can abuse of my role of chairman because that's not a question, but, but I got a question which is very much related to that uh, re just raised by Adriana. Uh, that is, uh, thinking about the literature on the geography of innovation, right? And, and, and connecting this literature with that literature on the knowledge base of region, right? So be or not shame, the, the Lund group and so on and so forth. Uh, do you think that um, train up data can actually help in filling a certain gap that I perceive myself in that literature and in capturing the symbolic knowledge, what's called symbolic knowledge of region. That's because there's a lot, you know, of, of discussion and there's a paper about the synthetic versus analytic knowledge of regions, but there's no so much about the symbolic part of the story. And I don't know, uh, I, I didn't see yet, you know, papers using thread marks to try to fill that, that, that gap. Is, is there a chance to do something there? Do you think that trademarks can actually be suitable 
to fill that gap. I'm sorry, Claudia, th th there's the next question. So I abused my role. You actually raised the question before, but uh, it, it was so much connected that I, I, I couldn't resist. <laughs> Okay, yes, I mean, this is uh, typically when, when I talk about the geography of, of, of innovation related to trademarks, I have a slide on the synthetic, analytical and symbolic knowledge base to exactly make this point that with trademarks, you could capture the symbolic knowledge base. Um, and uh, yeah, so there is, uh, yeah, surprisingly, there is not much research that have used this data source. Uh, there is um, a very nice case study uh, by uh, Mila Davids and Kuhn Franken on uh, the case of uh, Unilever, where they, they look at basically the different parts of the innovation process and they link them to, uh, uh, to also the role of the different types of knowledge bases. And they, yeah, they also mention uh, you know, branding and trademarks in the symbolic knowledge base. Uh, but I think, yeah, there is much more more potential to do that. One caveat uh, is um, that I'm not sure how valid uh, of an indicator for uh, innovation in the creative industries trademarks are. Yeah. Uh, because, uh, so I've done research on this and I find, uh, well, first of all, what is innovation in the creative industry is a is a still a question that has not been answered and because is every new creation an innovation uh, or not and what you see in this sector is that there are a lot of firms are not using uh, iprs and also they are not using trademarks so this casts doubts on the extent to which we can uh, count innovation in those sectors uh, uh, with trademarks um yeah so yeah. that's yeah yeah, so it might be the case that it's not the most suitable indicator for those sectors yet, so, so to say. Uh, now, Claudia, uh, I, I think that Alessandra has upgraded your status from panelist to, oh. to panelist, so you can talk. And, and <laughs> not surprisingly, the question that you're going to write is very much related that I had to ask. Not surprisingly, Claudia. Go not surprising. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for, for organizing the seminar and for letting me in as a panelist. And thank you, Carolina, for the amazing talk and uh, inspiring presentation you, you gave us. Um, I have um, actually uh, an interest uh, in the last uh, work that you presented, the, the ongoing one with uh, Morales and others. On the amazing data set that you collected uh, on uh, these innovators that do both uh, trademarks and parents, I was wondering if you had the opportunity to understand a bit more of these strategies followed by those uh, actors that decided to both patent and trademark an innovation. And precisely, I was wondering if you had the opportunity to ask them uh, what was they willing to, what particular part of the innovation they were willing to protect by either the trademark and the patent? And related to this, uh, if you had the chance to, to understand if they were following a different strategy that was dependent upon the innovation or product life cycle. Um, yeah, thanks, Claudia. Uh, no, we didn't ask them specifically for the, you know, all the, the reasoning behind the, the filing of each specific IPR. Uh, we did ask them uh, for uh, the whole battery of IP strategies, uh, not just uh, the, the formal ones, but also the informal ones. Um, uh, what to me, uh, this, this group of overlap uh, was always the least interesting because I thought, okay, well, that group you would have captured anyway with patents, right? And we all already know a lot about the complementarity between patents and trademarks. So to me, it was always more interesting to look at, you know, the, the, the ones that didn't go for, for this combination, which you know, we would expect to be the perfect combination if you can do both and you do both. Um, so both the combination of doing only patent without a trademark, uh, even if you have a product in the market or uh, yeah, doing only trademark without a patent. Uh, so I guess that gave us kind of a bias uh, into 
uh, asking specific uh, questions. Uh, but I, I, I should say there's more out of the survey that we can exploit, or that Pablo can exploit for his whole PhD thesis. So yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> And also, most importantly for you and, and Sandro, the, uh, one of the next papers might be specifically about sustainable innovation. So, <laughs> because we can zoom in on those uh, uh, innovations uh, that were candidates for uh, sustainable innovation context. Uh, so we can say something also about to what extent trademarks are valid indicators specifically for sustainable innovation. Uh, because yeah, there is lots of work on green patents, uh, but with with its limitations, right? <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. That, I totally agree with the last point. <laughs> <laughs> that, that that was actually one of my questions, Carolina. <laughs> when it, when you presented that that uh, that slide with the list of innovation characteristics, you know, new to the firm, new to the market, and blah blah blah, it was very tiny, and I was trying to see whether there was something related to the environmental nature of, of innovations. Maybe it's going to be in, in in future work, uh, but but but. Um, Related to that slide, uh, did you have a chance to detect whether the complementary use of patents or individual use of patents versus trademark is also affected by the, so to say, architectural kind of innovations that um, is introduced? You know, this distinction between architectural and modular. I don't know. My feeling is that architectural kind of innovation might need complementarity to a greater extent than the modular ones. I don't know whether you have detected that, that, that feature or not? We asked all these uh, all these questions. Eh? So when, all, in the questions about the kind of the innovation process uh, and innovation type, uh, we um, yeah we also had questions related to this uh, typology, also architectural. Um, I I don't have the the numbers uh, ready for you, but you know I can let you know. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's 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 not specifically in this paper, um, but by, might be another one. Okay. Yeah. And, and as I told you, the environmental or sustainability features of innovation is of course of, of, of very of high interest for us, for, for the work we are doing with, together with Claudia. And then we got another question, uh, which is again related to uh, to previous uh, question, Claudia. So you said that you are not so much interested uh, uh, in those innovations where there was a complementarity or, or complementing between patents and trademarks, right? But still they are there, right? And in, in your framework, uh, they still represent what you said, an improvement, right? In, in the extent to which you have been able to measure innovation, because I don't know whether I'm wrong or right, but when you talk about the improvement, you're actually claiming that you are able to capture innovation to a greater extent, right? Is that correct? So the first question is, in which sense is an improvement? Improvement in the sense that you're able to cover more innovation than it would have been capturing with bad and solid, right? Is yes. that okay? Yeah. yeah. So, but given that complementing patterns and framework is still there, um, I'm wondering to which extent uh, this is really an improvement or, and rather a simple strategic complementary use of IPRs, right? You know, you, you have firms that go with the different IPRs for simple strategic reasons, right? They will have a, a portfolio of IPRs for similar reasons. Uh, I'm, I'm hesitant to consider that this is a really an improvement in the kind of innovation that you're yeah. able to measure. But, th but then let me clarify. So the, the overlap patents trademark is not part of the improvement. Because that okay. I would we would have captured with patents only anyway. Okay. All right. So okay. it's only the the ones that are trademarked without patent that get added. Otherwise, yeah. indeed, you would you would have uh, yeah. So for 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 our focus, uh, these all, all these strategic practices uh, combining them for all kinds of reasons uh, are not improving measurement. All right. Okay. Now now get it. Now get yeah. it. Yeah. Sorry right. that I was not so clear. That right. was my, my fault. And yeah, I mean, I really appreciated the the, the choice of uh, using innovation as, as a unit of analysis, uh, as you said at the beginning, uh, 
that was very much popular in early studies about innovation when I was young and beautiful. Like the, first, the first books that I read, they were all, all of them, you know, about, it was about specific innovations. And I think that we need to go back to, 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 to those kind of studies because this is really the unit, unit of, of, of measurement. Um, I don't know if there are more questions from the floor. Uh, I think that myself, I've already raised the question that I was interesting. Any any other question from uh, Chiara? Do we have question from 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 YouTube? No, we don't. No, we don't have. Okay. Okay. So uh, if there are no more questions, I think that uh, I mean. We, we potentially could stay here and discuss longer, but uh, I suspect yeah, that but also I should, I should say, you know, feel free to email me with questions because I'm I'm kind of promoting a trademark, so I feel I should also be available, you know, to help people that uh, that want to, you know, they don't know where to find the data and uh, you know have no idea of the technicalities. Feel free to email me. Yeah, as, as Adriana and Alessandra were telling you before, uh, we, we are actually approaching trademark data for our work at, uh, at, the, at the regional level. So it might be actually the case that we get in touch with you and not only us, maybe, you know, co collaborate and cooperate on, on some research work if you're willing to. Sure, yes. Okay, okay so I think that uh, we can really Thank Carolina for this fascinating talk. It's really very nice. We really appreciate uh, Carolina your your talk. And uh, I mean, it's hard to say when we are gonna meet in person uh, in the future, but uh, I do hope uh, this gonna happen soon. Uh, in the meantime, uh, stay safe and, and and good luck for for this different moments in time. Okay. Thank you very much, Carolina. Ah, thanks uh, to you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Bye bye, Carolina. Ciao, ciao. Take Goodbye. Care. Bye. 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 bye.